Thank you, Kate, very much indeed. Can I also give my uh, thanks to um, Simeon Zokos and the, uh, his staff for this uh, extremely well-organized uh, conference, and I think the program is fantastic. So thank you very much indeed for inviting us uh, here. When I was saying in London that we were going to come to Delphi to talk about Brexit, of course, some uh, immediately thought we were looking for guidance from the oracle, as it were. Um, and um, perhaps we are collectively in need of, of guidance, and perhaps the Seven Sages uh, could give us uh, that uh, response. But we are the London School of Economics, and so I tend to think that if the Seven Sages at Delphi were asked questions about the, uh, Brexit, actually they would come to the LSE to find the answer. And I'm delighted that we've got uh, my two colleagues, Ian Begg and Tony Travers, uh, joining us, and a very good friend, uh, well known to the LSE, but also to you, Jorgos Pagulatis, to join the panel as well. Let me say one or two things by way of introduction, and I'm hoping the PowerPoint presentation will now uh, appear before you. What I wanted to uh, say uh, is something which is not happening at the moment, but, oh, great, good, it is happening. Right. Um, of course, we've heard uh, from the ambassador, quite rightly, the objectives of the, the government in terms of the negotiations. Putting it neutrally, there must be uh, unresolved questions, perhaps tensions, in the government's uh, objectives. This is not, I'm going to ignore that and I'm going to simply tell you uh, the presentation. A number of tensions in the objectives. The government's white paper recently talked about uh, not wishing to copy any existing model between the European Union and other European, Union, uh, other European states. It talked about it trying to establish the most free and without friction trade between the UK and the rest of the, Europe, and the, and the European Union. But at the same time, the government wishes to establish full control over immigration. The government has also set the objective of ending the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Uh, but the European Union establishes the premacy of the European Court of Justice in all of its external trade uh, arrangements. The government is committed to an open border with Ireland for obvious reasons of security in terms of Ireland. Uh, but at the same time, we wish to maintain the integrity of the immigration system. And the government says, quote, no deal is better than a bad deal. Um, we can surely ask the question as to whether we are really prepared in future economic relations for the UK to rely on the more minimal uh, provisions of the World Trade Organization, the WTO. And the government says that it will finish, quote, vast payments to the EU budget. But as we know, there are immediate liabilities, accrued liabilities, accumulated liabilities to settle, and some estimates place those of anything up to 60 billion euros to pay. So there are unresolved questions. It is an ambitious set of negotiations. What might be the reference points? What might be the kind of model uh, for the UK's relationship with the European Union going forward after Brexit? We say we don't wish to emulate an existing model, but uh, there are certain uh, principles which perhaps come from existing ar arrangements with other countries. Uh, one such is Norway. Norway is in the single European market, but of course it also pays a very substantial amount of money into the European Union budget. Pro rata, if Britain was to uh, pay a similar amount into the EU budget, we would say probably less than 1 billion euros per year uh, for access uh, to the single market but the maintenance of our sovereignty. If we think of the Canadian uh, free trade agreement, 
certainly it is a free trade agreement covering the vast majority of products, but it does nothing for uh, so-called non-tariff barriers or different product standards. So the trade could well be damaged uh, by that. And then finally, we often talk about the relationship between Switzerland and the European Union. And Switzerland does have, at the moment, seven separate bilateral agreements with the European Union. In principle, that could be adapted to the particular interests, priorities, of both the UK and the European Union. But that flexibility of the arrangement between Switzerland and of the European Union comes also with certain stipulations. Switzerland must implement EU legislation. The arrangement with Switzerland doesn't cover services. Services represent something like 80% of the UK GDP. Services are important to us. The Swiss model uh, includes the free movements of people, not the full control of immigration. And for this particular free trade agreement, Switzerland pays into the European Union's budget something like 40% of the amount that the UK currently pays into the EU budget. So the Norwegian model, the Canadian model, the Swiss model uh, are not easy reference points given the diverse objectives that the UK government wishes to uh, pursue. Might we then fall back on the World Trade Organization? Certainly the trade rules um, would benefit the European uh, 27 member states. They have a very significant uh, trading surplus in goods with the UK. But the provisions for services remain very unclear under the World Trade Organization. Uh, and as I say, the provisions for services are crucial to the UK economy. Some nations within the WTO are currently negotiating a so-called trade in services agreement. So it's kind of watch this space. So I think there are a number of important qualifications to be made in terms of the UK's objectives as the negotiations begin. Perhaps some reminders could be that um, the greatest economic gain comes from the most open trade arrangements. Anything less than the status quo is likely to have an economic uh, cost. Economists at the London School of Economics, and who would wish to consult any other economist? Uh, economists at the LSE uh, forecast that the effects of the different arrangements uh, would be uh, negative in their impact on the UK economy. A loss of gross domestic products, whether we follow Norway, whether we follow Switzerland, or the World Trade Organization. And these estimates of the loss to GDP are anything from 1.25% to 2.6% uh, or more over time. Let me try to uh, come to um, a close by simply emphasizing by way of introduction, clearly this is at best a very difficult journey to an unknown destination. The package of seeking a hard Brexit has clearly many contradictory objectives. There is an open question as to the impact for the UK as to whether by negotiating a hard Brexit we are going to be open to the world, the phrase at the moment is global Britain, whether we're going to be open to the world gaining autonomy or simply gaining uh, wider dependence on the wider international system. We simply become more dependent on more external powers. For the European Union, what might be the impacts of Brexit? Um, the European Union, of course, may become more cohesive. We had this, the speech of President Juncker in the uh, European Parliament uh, this week. But in the medium term, at least, the negotiation of Brexit uh, will be a huge distraction of time and energy, complex negotiations uh, taking place, and in the medium term, of course, we have a number of political uncertainties, not least with the elections coming up 
uh, in this calendar year. Euroscepticism, Euroscepticism, born and developed in London, has clearly been a significant export across the European Union with different varieties of Euroscepticism, different varieties of populism, and therefore the impact of Brexit may possibly be to make the European Union more cohesive. Equally, it could be to worsen the sense of self-doubt and the lack of uh, cohesion. It would seem that the one prediction we can make, and I'll finish with this, is that uh, certainty and stability will take a long time to uh, recur uh, in the UK's relations with the European Union. It is a difficult journey to an uncertain destination. So that was by way of introduction, and I'm now going to call on my colleagues to make their presentations, and uh, to begin with Professor Ian Begg uh, from the European Institute of the LSE.